जय जय श्री चैतन्य जय नित्यानंद जय द्वैत चंद्र जय गौर भक्त वृंद रीडिंग फ्रॉम श्री चैतन्य चरितमृता मध्य लीला चैप्टर ट्वेंटी वन एन टाइटल द ऑपुलेंस एंड स्वीटनेस ऑफ लॉर्ड कृष्ण रीडिंग फ्रॉम टेक्स्ट हंड्रेड एंड फाइव थ्रू टेक्स्ट हंड्रेड एंड फिफ्टीन टेक्स्ट हंड्रेड एंड फाइव भूषण रूषण अंग ताहे ललित त्रिभंग ताहारूदनुनर्तन तेरा छे नेत्रांत बन तारा दृढ़ सन्धान बिंधे राधा गोपी गुण मन translation ornaments caress that body but the transcendental body of krishna is so beautiful that it beautifies the ornaments he wears therefore krishna's body is said to be the ornament of ornaments enhancing the wonderful beauty of krishna is his three curved style of standing above all these beautiful features Krishna's eyes dance and more obliquely acting like arrows to pierce the minds of Shrimati Radharani and the gopis when the arrow succeeds in hitting its target their minds become agitated text 106 the beauty of Krishna's body is so attractive that it attracts not only the demigods and other living entities within this material world but the personalities of the spiritual sky as well including the narayan who are expansions of krishna's personality the minds of the narayanas are thus attracted by the beauty of krishna's body in addition the goddess of fortune lakshmi who are the wives of the narayanas are and are the women described in the vedas as most chaste are also attracted by the wonderful beauty of krishna text 107 favoring the gopis krishna rides on the chariots of their minds and just to receive loving service from them he attracts their minds like cupid therefore he is also called madana mohana the attractor of cupid cupid has five arrows representing form taste smell sound and touch krishna is the owner of these five arrows and with this sorry and with his cupid like beauty he conquers the mind of the gopis though they are very proud of their super excellent beauty becoming a new cupid krishna attracts their minds and engages in the rasa dance text 108 when lord krishna wanders in the forest of vrindavan with his friends on an equal level there are innumerable cows grazing this is another of the lord's blissful enjoyments when he plays on his flute all living entities including trees plants animals and human beings tremble and are saturated with jubilation tears flow constantly from their eyes text 109 krishna wears a pearl necklace that appears like a chain of white ducks around his neck the peacock feather in his hair appears like a rainbow and his yell and his yellow garments appear like lightning in the sky krishna appears like a newly risen cloud and the gopis appear like newly grown grains in the field constant rains of nectarian pastimes fall upon these newly grown grains and it seems that the gopis are receiving beams of life from krishna exactly as green grains receive life from the rains 
Text 110. The Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna is full in all six opulences, including his attractive beauty, which engages him in conjugal love with the gopis. Such sweetness is the, quite, is the quintessence of his qualities. Shukadev Goswami, the son of Vyasadev, has described these pastimes of Krishna throughout Srimad Bhagavatam. Hearing the descriptions, the devotees become mad with love of God. Text 111. Just as the women of Mathura ecstatically describe the fortune of the gopis of Vrindavan and the transcendental qualities of Krishna, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu described the different mellows of Krishna and became overwhelmed with ecstatic love. Grasping the hand of Sanatan Goswami, he recited the following verse. Text 112. This is a verse from Srimad Bhagavatam. What austerities must the gopis have performed? With their eyes always they drink the nectar of the form of Lord, of, of Lord Krishna, which is the essence of loveliness and is not to be equaled or surpassed. That loveliness is the only abode of beauty, fame, and opulence. It is self-perfect ever fresh and unique. Text 113. The bodily beauty of Sri Krishna is like a wave in the ocean of eternal youth. In that great ocean is the whirlpool of the awakening of ecstatic love. The vibration of Krishna's flute is like a whirlwind. And the flickering minds of the gopis are like straws and dry leaves. After they fall down in the whirlwind, they never rise again, but remain eternally at the lotus feet of Krishna. Text 114. Oh, my dear friend, what severe austerities have the gopis performed to drink his transcendental beauty and sweetness through their eyes in complete fulfillment? Thus they glorify their births, bodies, and minds. Text 115. The sweetness of Krishna's beauty enjoyed by the gopis is unparalleled. Nothing is equal to or greater than such ecstatic sweetness. Even the predominating deities of the Vaikuntha planets, the Narayanas, do not possess such sweetness. Indeed, none of the incarnations of Krishna after Narayan possess such transcendental beauty. Om Ajnana Timirandhasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshiruvan Valita Myena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashthaya Bhutale Srimate Radhanath Swaminiti Namine Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashthaya Bhutale Srimate Jayapataka Swaminiti Namine Namah Chaya Padaya Nitai Kripa Pradayane Gaurakatha Dhamadaya Nagara Kramatarine Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunivadi Paschatya Deshatarine Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadal Harshavasadi Gauravakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Mukham Kroti Vachalam Pangulangaya De Girim Yat Kripata Maham Vande Shri Gurum Dinatarinam Paramananda Madhavam Shri Chaitanya Ishwaram Haryam Tatsat <coughs> So, as the chapter entitles, you know, the sweetness of Krishna, these verses indeed are so sweet, so nectarian. You know, when Priti Vilasini Mataji gave me the flow of the verse starting from text 105 I couldn't stop you know um, not reading it in a complete series till text 115 um, it's it's so nectarian it's so sweet it just talks of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu it's like he is immersing us in the unlimited ocean of Krishna's nectarian 
sweetness and his nectarian beauty. You know, words are falling short. It seems as if, you know, how um, the Goswamis describe that wish we had, you know, thousands and years and thousands of tongues to glorify and listen to the um, everlasting qualities of Krishna, the eternal qualities of Krishna, to glorify the qualities of Krishna, you know. So it really feels like Mahaprabhu has become so you know, is the possessor of thousands of tongues that he's so beautifully, amazingly glorifying Krishna using such beautiful words. And I'm really amazed at the kind of, um, you know, these these words in Bengali, they are really, really beautiful. And the way Srila Prabhupada has just so perfectly, you know, transcendentalized the English language is beyond any words, you know. How Srila Prabhupada is so beautifully plated, each and every one of these um, explicit Bengali, you know, words, and so beautifully given us an understanding into the aspect of Krishna's beauty. He's given us, um, you know, the entrance, you know, into Krishna's beauty and Krishna's sweetness. So the first verse that we read... Yeah, so of course we are eternally, eternally indebted to Srila Prabhupada for, you know, these beautiful, you know, I, when I was reading these particular verses, I remembered um, <clears throat> the first time that I was reading Chaitanya Charitamrita in completeness, you know, this particular, this Madhya Leela is what, um, this chapter, I remember I had read it three times. It was so beautiful. And I, I couldn't, I had to go back again and again to read this particular chapter when I was reading it for the first time. And I remember that, um, you know, there was one devotee, Shruta Kirti Prabhu, or you all must know him. He, he used to be Srila Prabhupada's personal servant. And, um, he was narrating this particular pastime that whenever, you know, books would come out, you know, fresh, hot off the press, you know, when Srila Prabhupada would receive his uh, books, that would be the most, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a vision to behold, you know, whenever Srila Prabhupada would be presented um, his books, which have come out fresh off the press, and Srila Prabhupada would hold them, and his eyes would become big, and a beautiful smile would just brighten Srila Prabhupada's face. You know, he would be so happy to receive, you know, a book that has come, you know, freshly, uh, that come out of the print. He'd be so happy to see them. And especially one time when this Chaitanya Charitamrita, you know, every time they would have um, a volume printed, they would bring it to Srila Prabhupada. And then, you know, so Srila Prabhupada said one time when he received the Chaitanya Charitamrita, the reaction was the same. You know, Prabhupada would hold this book in his two lotus hands and then his eyes would become big, his eyebrows would lift up, you know, and his, a smile, an enchanting smile would brighten his, you know, lotus-like face, and Srila Prabhupada would be so happy. And Srila Prabhupada said, this Chaitanya Charitamrita is the actual Bengali Rashagulla, Prabhupada said. And, you know, that it's so sweet. It is so nectarian. Uh, Wherever you bite, it will be very sweet, Shla Prabhupada said. So, you know, by reading this particular chapter especially, you know, uh, we can realize that aspect that Shla Prabhupada mentioned, that how sweet uh, is this Chaitanya Charitamrita. And, uh, you know, our gratitude to Shla Prabhupada for giving this, you know, rare treasure at, you know, at the palms of our hands. We are so grateful to Srila Prabhupada and to our Guru Vargas. So the first verse that we read today, text 105, it's saying that ornaments caress that body, but the transcendental body of Krishna is so beautiful that it beautifies the ornaments he wears. You see, Krishna would be decorated with very, very beautiful ornaments. You know, Mother Jashoda would personally choose, you know, what 
kind of jewelry Krishna is going to wear every day. And she would keep them on a plate, you know, his, um, you know, things that he'll wear in his lotus feet, his ankle belts, little toe rings, um, then a nice little belt around his waist, beautiful pearl necklaces, some nice necklaces, um, chokers and things like that. Then armlets, bracelets, you know, earrings. And then finally Krishna's, you know, little sash of a crown. So all of these ornaments that was picked by Mother Yashoda, she would pick the best of jewelry. And then they would look so beautiful, you know, when they were laid out on the tray. They would look so beautiful the way Mother Yashoda would, you know, organize each and every jewelry for each of the limbs of Krishna's body. He, she would organize it in that way. They would themselves look so beautiful. And then by the time Krishna would come out of his, you know, after freshening up, he would, um, you know, after his uh, bathing, when Krishna would come out, then by that time all the sakhas would have also come. So they actually start assisting Mother Jashoda in decorating Krishna. And one time when Mother Jashoda was doing this, she wished to just hold Krishna and they would stand very lovingly looking at each other and each of the sakhas would take each jewelry and they would start putting it on different limbs of Krishna's body. They would start decorating him. And then one day when Sakha said, Maya, look. And then Mother Jashoda said, what happened, Lala, what happened? And then this, little cowherd boy said that Maya, when you had all the jewelry on your tray, it looked so beautiful. But now when it's gone onto Krishna's body, it's like Krishna's body made the jewelry look much more beautiful. The beauty of the jewelry have increased because they have now come on the body of Krishna. They rest on the body of Krishna. They have taken shelter at the body of Krishna, upon the body of Krishna. So therefore their beauty have increased so much. Krishna has given beauty to the jewelry. He has increased their beauty. And Maya Yashoda just laughed. She said, yes, indeed, that is true. And that is what Mahaprabhu is quoting here, that the the beauty of the ornaments is beautified when they are adorning the body of Krishna. So Krishna's body is said to be, therefore, the ornament of all ornaments. And enhancing the wonderful beauty of Krishna is his three-curved style of standing, the Tribhanga Lalita. Tribhanga, Krishna's body is bent in three different uh, parts. The first part is the lotus feet. You know, Krishna stands with his left foot straight and his right foot over the left foot. So that is the first curve. Uh, and also, of course, that, that you know, curve makes his knee, his right knee, bend. So that is the first curve, the knee bending, his right knee bending. And because his right knee is bending, so therefore that makes the left part of his waist, you know, his hips, the left part of his hips turn out, you know, move out the other way. So the right leg, knee, then the left of his hips is moving out and therefore now to manage this position he has to move his shoulder you know um, his right shoulder and um, uh, his arms he has to bend out in you know this way he has to bend down so therefore his shoulder uh, he's not having straight shoulders his shoulder, one is up and one is down. His left shoulder is down and his right shoulder is up. And therefore his head also appears tilted. And it is tilted, you know, towards the left side. Therefore he is tilted towards Srimati Radharani. You know, his head is, you know, trying to move towards Srimati Radharani. That is the beauty of Krishna. So that's why Krishna appears in this 
threefold bending form. He is not straight. Krishna is very crooked, as they say. That um, therefore, even the worship of Krishna um, is not so easy because he himself is so crooked. So his worship also has to be very crooked. It, it cannot be that simple. But Srila Prabhupada always said that Krishna consciousness is simple for the simple-minded. Krishna becomes, you know, very simple for the simple-minded. But if we become complicated, Krishna becomes maha-complicated for us. So we should try to keep um, everything simple so that Krishna will manifest his simple form to us. So simply just stick to Srila Prabhupada, stick to our Guru Vargas, and then we can experience the simplicity of Krishna. And we can, in, in simplicity, we can um, um, relish the complicated form of Krishna. You know, that is the beauty of Srila Prabhupada's mercy. So this is how Krishna is, that's why he is known as Tribhanga Lalita. Madana Mohana. Um, he is so beautiful that he is, he is bent in three parts, and that's why he is, Lalita means very beautiful, very enchanting. And the next verse, next few verses, Krishna is addressed as Madana Mohana, that the attractor of Cupid. Cupid is Madana, Mohana means attractor. So one who attracts even the minds of Cupid, the mind of Cupid is called as Madana Mohana. It is explained that Krishna's eyes dance just like, and they are like arrows that pierce the minds of Srimati Radharani and the gopis. You know, Krishna, when he looks, he actually shoots arrows. You know, like we were explaining the other day, that it is explained that Krishna's eyebrows are like the, um, is like the bow of Kandarpa, of Cupid. So Krishna's eyebrows are so beautiful that they're shaped like Kandarpa's bow, and his vision is like that of the arrow. So with his eyebrows, you know, when we want to shoot an arrow, using a bow, what we do, we put the arrow and we, you know, stretch out the bow and then release. Then the arrow shoots out. And similarly, Krishna also, when he wants to shoot his um, arrows of his eyes, of his vision, to the gopis and to Srimati Radharani, he uses his eyebrows and he stares at Srimati Radharani and the gopis and they are pierced with the loving vision of Krishna. And it is explained by Mahaprabhu that it succeeds in hitting its target, which is the minds of the gopis. The minds of the gopis become immediately very agitated as soon as they, you know, they are um, hit by the vision of Krishna's arrow. So like this, so beautifully, the... Um, um, the beauty of Krishna is explained here by Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And it's said that the second verse that we read today, 106, it is said that, that not only the beauty of Krishna's body is so amazing and so attractive that it not only just attracts the devatas or the living entities, but it also attracts the Narayanas. Now, why is it saying Narayanas, plural? It's because there are so many innumerable Vaikuntha planets where there are different Narayans who are residing. So all of those Narayans, they actually get captivated by the beauty of Krishna, not just Narayan, but even the Narayan's consort, Srimati Lakshmi Devi. She is also attracted by the wonderful beauty of Krishna that, you know, how it is explained that how Lakshmi Devi, we all know that Lakshmi Devi also wanted access to come to Brajadham and to, you know, participate in the Rasalila. 
And Krishna, she actually approached Krishna that, Krishna, I'm really so attracted to you. I really want to come into your Rasa Leela dance just to witness the loving exchange that you have with the gopis. Then Krishna said, well, it's out of my jurisdiction. Even I can't give you permission to enter into my own Rasa dance. That permission can be given only by my dear consorts, the gopis. So then Lakshmi Devi said, all right, no problem. I will seek the blessings of the gopis. I will seek their permission. I will please them with my austerity. And from that day onwards, it is said that Lakshmi Devi is residing in one of the forests in Vrindavan, which is called as Bilvavan or Bilvan. And she is performing austerities over there till today so that she can please the gopis and the gopis would allow her access into the Rasa dance. So that is the glory of Lakshmi Devi, how she is doing tapasya in Brajadham. And this is also establishing that, you know, in, without any doubt that Krishna is indeed the Supreme Personality of Godhead, even uh, supreme than Lord Narayan in the Vaikuntha planets. Moving on, it is explained that Favoring the gopis, Krishna rides on the chariots of their minds, and just to receive loving service from them, he attracts their minds like Cupid. You see, here a very important point to note is that just to receive loving services from them, you see, there is reciprocation. Krishna is also hungry for one thing, which is love. The entire creation is moving on the principle of give and take. So even the spiritual world is moving on this particular aspect. It is functioning on this particular aspect of give and take. So Krishna is also, you know, it's not that God is just, you know, one one point that Srila Prabhupada would always say is that God is not our order supplier. That we just go to him and say, oh God, give us our daily bread. And then he just comes and gives us our daily bread. And what are we doing in return? To reciprocate with God. At least, what can we do to, you know, say thank you to God? You know, where is that love? Where is that reciprocation? So, that is something that we really, really need to understand. That even Krishna is actually looking for loving reciprocation. That's what even Krishna wants. So that's why Srila Prabhupada trained us in chanting the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. When we are chanting, our prayer in the Hare Krishna Mahamantra is that, O Radhe, O Mother Hara, O Krishna, O Rama, I am now disgusted by this material um, you know, modes. I'm just drowning in this material world. Please pick me up and engage me in your loving service. That is the prayer of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. And when we pray like this, when we chant and pray to Krishna, calling out to the holy names, at that time then Krishna being pleased with our pure desire to serve, he engages us in his service. So there is reciprocation. It is not one-sided. It is not that, you know, we just um, do something and or maybe just God does something and we don't know what's happening. You know, it's not something like that. We do something tangible and Krishna also reciprocates by doing something tangible for us. So we need to realize this aspect that Krishna and the living entities have a loving exchange. And he is therefore known as Madan Mohana. Moving on, Mahaprabhu says that when Lord Krishna wanders in the forest of Vrindavan with his friends on an equal level, there are innumerable cows grazing. This is another of the Lord's blissful enjoyments that Mahaprabhu is saying that, yes, 
Mahaprabhu, uh, sorry, Krishna is enjoying with the gopis that his love for the gopis is unparalleled. It is the topmost, it is the highest. But there is also the level that, you know, which is less intimate than the conjugal love, but it is on the level of the Sakyaras, where Krishna is roaming around with his cowherd boyfriends as equals. Very important. On an equal level, there is no superiority. Even Krishna, if he loses in the game, then Krishna has to carry one of the cowherd boys because he lost and he is deserving punishment. Just like if anybody else also loses um, in the game, then they have to carry Krishna. So if Krishna loses, he also has to carry them. So that time Krishna does not display his opulence of being the supreme. He does not utilize his right of being the supreme personality of Godhead and make everybody else lose so that he can win. No, Krishna never does that. He is very fair. He actually plays the game. He does cheat also. But, you know, Krishna does, you know, play it very fairly, you know. So because... um, the love, you know, Srila Prabhupada explains in Krishna book that the love is so much that Krishna actually loses to the love of his devotees. The love is so great, it is greater than the supremacy of Krishna himself. The supreme position of Krishna is compromised by the love of his devotees. And therefore, Krishna gives up that supremacy and he becomes their sold out servant. That is the beauty of Krishna. That is the beauty of Krishna's supremacy. So, And when Krishna plays his flute, all the living entities, including the trees, the plants, the animals, the human beings, they tremble and are saturated with jubilation. Tears flow constantly from their eyes, listening to the transcendental sound coming from Krishna's divine flute. This is the effect. Just imagine, you know, in Govardhan Hill, Krishna is sitting under a Kadamba tree. He just starts playing on his enchanting flute and the most blissful enchanting sound coming out. The trees are amazed. They're trembling. And when the trees tremble, what do they do? When someone is trembling, they shake. So when trees shake, what happens? The flower-bearing trees, they just tremble, and then all the flowers, they just come drizzling down upon Krishna. Then the fruit-bearing trees, when they tremble, all the fruits, the ripened fruits, they fall down. So the Sakhas and Krishna, they immediately go and start eating the fruits. That is the beauty of Brajadham. That is the beauty of Krishna's flute effect. You know, how when they tremble, that trembling is also for the service of Krishna. You know, when Krishna is sitting under a tree, therefore when Krishna is playing the flute, he never sits under a fruit tree. Because, you know, the fruits will otherwise fall on Krishna's head. He always makes sure that he sits under a flower-bearing tree so that the flowers can nicely drizzle upon Krishna. They shower Krishna with their love. The trees are showering Krishna with their love of flowers and fruits. Text 109, very, very beautiful description of the jewelry of Krishna. It is explained that Krishna wears a pearl necklace that appears like a chain of white ducks around his neck. How sweet is that? You know, when ducks move around, you know, next time you go to a riverside, you know, in America, at least we are very blessed that we have, you know, little uh, lakes, little ponds, little, you know, river outlets. Every community almost has it. And over there we can you know, generally see, you know, these little ducks, you know, going around, and they always go in a nice little, you know, pack. And uh, so whenever next time you see, you know, a line of, a pack of white ducks, let's remember that this is Krishna wearing his white pearl necklace, which are strung around his neck. 
the peacock feather in his hair appears like a rainbow and his yellow garments appear like lightning in the sky. You know, um, one class I was listening by His Grace Janani Vast Prabhu and he said that many people ask that why is the sky blue? You know, kids mostly, they ask, why is the sky blue? The answer is that it is because Krishna, his bodily complexion is, um, you know, bluish black. So therefore the effulgence that Krishna emanates, that comes out as blue. And that is why the color of the sky is blue. So when there is lightning in the sky, that lightning is like Krishna's garments, yellow garments. Just imagine, you know, the blue sky with the lightning coming across, that's Krishna wearing your yellow dhoti. It's such a beautiful meditation. And Krishna appears like a newly risen cloud and the gopis appear like gr- like new grains in the field. You know, when new grains in the field come, they are actually just waiting for the fresh rain showers to come. So the gopis, their only purpose of living is so that they can just get drenched by the loving grace of Krishna. So when Krishna appears like that, he just drenches the gopis with his pure love. And the gopis become completely nourished by Krishna's pure love. Just like the fresh grown grains become completely nourished by the fresh rain showers. What a beautiful analogy Mahaprabhu has given here. And text 110 goes on to explain that um, the attractive beauty of Krishna Krishna is full in all six opulences, including his attractive beauty, which engages him in conjugal love with the gopis. Such sweetness is the quintessence of his qualities. Quintessence means? Quintessence, it just means that it's the um, epitome of his um, you know, qualities. It's the supreme of all of his qualities. Shukadev Goswami, the son of Vyasadev, has described these pastimes of Krishna throughout Srimad Bhagavatam. And hearing the descriptions, the devotees become mad with love of God. We pray that when that day will come when we can become mad listening to the nectarian pastimes of the, and the descriptions that are given in the Srimad Bhagavatam, when can we become mad? So I was just listening to one very sweet pastime. My Prabhu was mentioning it to me the other day about uh, Shukadev Goswami. So Shukadev Goswami, uh, he is not, you know, we refer to him as Shukadev Goswami. But if you read the Srimad Bhagavatam, whenever it is, uh, you know, like how it says Vyasa Uvacha or... um, you know, Parikshit Uvacha, like that, whenever it talks about Shukadev Goswami, it never says Shukadev uh, Uvacha. It says Shri Shuka Uvacha. There's this particular reason why uh, Shukadev Goswami, his name is Shri Shuka. Shri refers to Srimati Radharani, and Shuka means parrot. So Shukadev Goswami is actually Srimati Radharani's parrot. And therefore, the entire Srimad Bhagavatam, he is referred to as Sri Shuka. So the Sri Shuka, he was actually a parrot, you know, and uh, he was listening to Bhagavad Katha. And um, when he was listening to Bhagavad Katha, he actually, you know, um, he started getting chased because, you know, there was this, um, he was um, making this, you know, sound that, um, uh, you know, he was, there was one, um, I forget who it was, um, sorry, I don't remember, it was actually a pregnant lady, she was listening from her husband, the Bhagavad Katha, I completely have lost who it was, but um, the husband tells the wife that I want you to listen to this Bhagavad Katha, and every time you can keep saying, hmm, 
hmm, hmm. So if you say hmm, then I will know that you are attentive and you are listening to it. So then, um, so they started reciting, and then you know the wife actually she had so after some time the husband looked up and saw that the wife was fast asleep. She had fallen asleep, but the sound of hmm, hmm, hmm was coming, and. He looked around and he saw that there was this parrot sitting on the tree and he was saying, hmm, 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 like that. So then that, you know, that devotee, he got very agitated and he started running behind that um, parrot. And he started running, running, running. And then he came, he started chasing that parrot and he came to uh, Badrikashram in um, in in Badrinath, they came to Badrikashram, that parrot flew, and that was Sri Shukha. He flew, and at that very moment, Vyasadev was narrating Srimad Bhagavatam to his wife, to Satyavati Devi. And then, um, and Satyavati Devi was so much, you know, um, enamored by the pastimes of Krishna, she was actually listening, and her mouth was open. You know, and she, when she was listening, her mouth was open. And then, you know, uh, this Sri Shukra, he actually, you know, to hide from that devotee, he just entered into the mouth of Satyavati Devi and went into her womb, took shelter of her womb. That's how uh, Shukadev Goswami actually was, uh, Sri Shukha was conceived, you know. And at that time, um, he actually heard the entire Srimad Bhagavatam from his father, Vyasadev, while in his mother's womb. And then he was not ready to come out. It was 16 years of pregnancy that, you know, um, a mother was going through. And then Vyasadev was concerned that, you know, this is 16 years are over and this child is not ready to come out. And then uh, the Vyasadev asked the child that, my dear son, please come out. He said, no, 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 I'm not coming out because as soon as I come out, I will be, you know, contaminated by the um, material world. So I don't want to come out. So then Vyasadev, you know, he actually headed out to Dwarka and he invited Krishna that, you know, that Krishna would come and give assurance to Shukadev Goswami that he won't be affected. So Shukadev, uh, Krishna, uh, you know, came back with Vyasadev. And that was almost the time when Krishna was winding up his pastimes, actually. So he came and he assured Shukadev Goswami, that I am giving you the assurance, my dear Sri Shuka, you come out and you will not be affected by this, uh, you know, uh, material modes. And uh, me, Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, I am giving you this assurance. So hearing that, Sri Shuka came out as a 16-year-old boy. So very, very special pastime. Uh, of how Sri Shukadev Goswami actually came and how he narrated the entire Srimad Bhagavatam to Parikshit Maharaj. It's a very beautiful, very beautiful pastime. So that is how Sri Shuka is described. Moving on, text 111 describes that just as the women of Mathura ecstatically described the fortune of the gopis of Vrindavan and the transcendental qualities of Krishna, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu described the different mellows of Krishna and became overwhelmed with ecstatic love. Grasping the hand of Sanatana Goswami, he recited the following verse from Srimad Bhagavatam where Mahaprabhu is saying that what austerities must the gopis have performed? With their eyes, they always drink the nectar in the form of Krishna, which is the essence of loveliness and is not to be equaled or surpassed. That loveliness is the only abode of beauty, fame, and opulences. It is self-perfect, ever-fresh, and unique. Mahaprabhu is glorifying the good fortune of the gopis. So the next verse, text 113, is so beautiful, it's so nectarian the way Mahaprabhu is describing 
the deep analogy that he is giving here in this particular verse. He's saying that the bodily beauty of Sri Krishna is like a wave in the ocean of eternal youth. So the eternal youth is actually an ocean. And Krishna's bodily beauty is like a wave in that ocean of eternal youth. So in that great ocean is the whirlpool of the awakening of ecstatic love. You know how in oceans there are whirlpools where if you fall in that whirlpool, the ocean will just suck you in. You'll just get sucked in. So the whirlpool, what is that whirlpool in that great ocean? Is the awakening of ecstatic love. The vibration of Krishna's flute is like that of that whirlwind. And the flickering minds of the gopis are like straws and dry leaves. So now, the flute, the sound of Krishna's flute is that whirlwind. So, and the gopis' minds are like the straws and dry leaves. So after they fall into the whirlwind, they never rise again. Imagine. Just imagine when straw or dry leaves, when they fall into a whirlwind, they are sucked down to the bottom of the ocean. So similarly, the minds of the gopis, when they listen to the flute sound coming from Krishna, they just get drawn so much. They just get so attracted that they never rise again, but remain eternally at the lotus feet of Krishna. So therefore, the minds of the gopis being captivated by the whirlwind of Krishna's flute just stays in the wave of Krishna's lotus feet. Such a beautiful analogy Mahaprabhu has given here in this particular verse. And Mahaprabhu continues to say, Then, my dear friend, what severe austerities have the gopis performed to drink his transcendental beauty and sweetness through their eyes to complete fulfillment? Thus they glorify their births, bodies, and minds. How glorified the gopis are that they are constantly drinking the nectar of Krishna's beauty with their eyes. The Mahaprabhu was continuing to say, the sweetness of Krishna's beauty enjoyed by the gopis is unparalleled. Nothing is equal to or greater than such ecstatic sweetness. Even the predominating deities of the Vaikuntha planets, the Narayans, do not possess such sweetness. Indeed, none of the incarnations of Krishna up to Narayan possess such transcendental beauty that how the gopis are so fortunate, so fortunate, that they're constantly drinking the nectar of the beauty of Krishna. Such fortune is not there even by, even possessed by anybody else that the fortune is possessed by the gopis. And therefore Mahaprabhu himself says, that gopi bhartu pada kamalayo radasa dasa dasa nadas. That we should strive and aspire to just be the servant of the servant of the servant of the lotus feet of the gopis. And the gopis, what do they say when they are separated from Krishna? They are saying to Krishna that, oh Krishna, when you are going away into the forest, the small moment, a tiny fraction of a second is like a millennium for us because we cannot see you. Even when we can eagerly look upon your beautiful face, our pleasure is actually hindered by our eyelids which were, the, which were fashioned by the foolish creator, Lord Brahma. So that is the mood of the gopis. And similarly, Mahaprabhu himself in his Shikshashtakam was also says something very similar to this. Mahaprabhu says, Yuga itam nimishena chakshusha pravishayitam shunya itam jagat sarvam govinda viraheiname that he govinda in your separation one moment is like a yuga. Yuga itam nimishena. 
So similarly, in the Gopi Geet, also the Gopis are saying something very, very similar, just like how Mahaprabhu is saying that a fraction of a second becomes um, like a millennium for the Gopis. So when, oh, when, oh, when will that day be ours that we can aspire to, you know, have such deep attraction towards our japa that we can, you know, not have to force ourselves to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, that we we can be, uh, you know, um, unstoppable to take up our bead bag and to just chant the holy names, chant the holy names, chant the holy names. So I'll just want to recite one verse of the Gopi Geet, which talks about this particular mood of the gopis, that how a tiny fraction of a second becomes a millennium for them. So this is the love of the gopis, and we beg at their lotus feet to allow us to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra with this same mood, that we can chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra without cessation. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu ki jai Shri Mati Radharani ki jai Shri Vrajavadhu ki jai Hare Krishna uh, yeah, Sorry, Skon Vartaman Guru Vrindu ki jai Hare Krishna If there's any questions, comments or reflections We can take that now Thank you very much Hare Krishna Mati Ji, Dhanvat Pranam uh, Mataji, I had a query. Like when we uh, hear the classes and when we listen, uh, there are different rasas in which uh, the love for Krishna is being explained, right? So like the uh, gopis have different bhav, the mother Yashoda has different bhav. So when we as devotees, when we pray to the Lord, what exactly bhava should we have or what would be appropriate? Because I really get confused in that. Like does it differ from time to time or should it be stable? Well, uh, Srila Prabhupada actually mentions that because, um, you know, a very similar question was asked last time also. And uh, the main thing is that Srila Prabhupada was very careful in giving us the right kind of shiksha. He said that we should not get deviated by thinking that we are in Sakyaras or Vatsalyaras right now because we are so contaminated, we are not in the pure level. So therefore, the only rasa that we should have with Krishna at the present moment is Dasya, that we are servant and Krishna is our Lord and Master. So when we have this kind of uh, attitude and we continue rendering our services in this rasa of being the servant, and then time is right, uh, whenever the time is right, and whenever the time our guru feels is right, he will reveal it to us. It could be in this life, it could be in the next life, whenever that is. Um, he will reveal to us that what is our eternal relationship in what rasa we actually serve Krishna will be revealed to us. So we should not try to artificially, you know, think that, okay, I'm in this rasa, I'm in that rasa, because then it becomes very sentimental. And Srila Prabhupada was, you know, very careful in keeping us, you know, in the proper consciousness, having the right consciousness, so that we don't get all these, uh, you know, get into all these crazy deviations and become very sahajiya, you know, become very watered down that way. So we have to be careful. I hope that answers your question. Yes, Mataji. This is Sita Priti Devi Dasi, Mataji. Hare Krishna, Hare, Hare Krishna. Krishna. Thank you. Ma Mataji, one more query. 
like when we uh, we say like we cannot directly approach Krishna, it has to go b- through proper channel, and then Radharani uh, always refers you to Krishna. So when we are praying for something, like something or some service rather, like it's always service. So if we pray to Radharani, this is just my experience. What I've seen is like when we pray to Radharani, you you get through those things. So does that mean that Radharani recommends you or are you eligible to do it or what happens exactly that time? See, the thing is that a line of succession that we should try to do is that um, we should definitely, yes, Radharani is the ultimate one who recommends us, but our approach is only our spiritual master. You know, that is the level that we can go up to. Then spiritual master recommends us to his spiritual master like that and the and the um you know, the spiritual master is said to be the confidential servitor of Srimati Radharani. So when he recommends us to Srimati Radharani, she listens, you know, and then she ultimately recommends us to Krishna like that. So our main con- connection that, you know, we should also not try to independently approach Srimati Radharani. The point is that. Mm-hmm. should actually just sincerely serve our spiritual master and he will take care of, you know, making sure that we get what we want to get. Okay. Thank you, Maji. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mataji, yes. are we are for uh, Tulsi, Manzari or Tulsi, Ali to Krishna, and then how we can honor them? Yes, uh, when you offer Tulasi, you you know, the next day when you take the Tulasi leaves out, at that time you can give it to your family members, and it is recommended to just suck on the Tulasi leaves till they just melt in your mouth. Don't bite on them, don't chew on them. Um, that's all. Just allow them to allow the tulsi leaf to just melt in your mouth. It just melts. She just melts, actually. Um, and then you know, just swallow. That's how you're supposed to honor tulsi leaves and manjaris. Uh, okay. Okay, Mataji. Okay. Uh, and Mato, the best way to pray to Acharyas is again, you know, see, the thing is that we don't exist. We don't have any existence or any identity without our spiritual master. That is the bottom line. So when we are approaching even the other Acharyas, how should we approach them? We should approach them by saying that, you know, uh, I am a very fallen disciple of you know, give the name of our spiritual master. And, you know, uh, I we beg at the lotus feet of our spiritual master that he will allow us, you know, that this is our prayer to you, our dear Acharya, that, um, you know, please allow us to, you know, follow our spiritual master. Pray, pray in that way by giving your identity. Our identity is that we are, the disciple of our spiritual master. That is our identity. So when even when we pray, we actually pray with, with that identity. We don't have a separate existence without that identity. And, um, and that day also, the way I personally pray is that I actually pray to my spiritual master. I say that, you know, today is the appearance day of this particular acharya, so my dear Guru Maharaj, please bless me so that I can, you know, stay chaste to our parampara. I can, you know, do this for Rupa Goswami. Then, you know, you have certain prayers for Rupa Goswami that you can say. So things like that. So you are always connecting it with your, you're linking it with your Guru. Not that you are approaching the Acharya on your own. You never do that. That is not proper etiquette. So um, we should always approach any personality, whoever we approach, um, that our main identity is that uh, that our spiritual master has given us. So therefore, we keep that identity. And we pray to them also with that particular identity of ours. Does that make sense? Yes, Mataji, it will be very helpful for me. I was confused, but just I pray. Uh, but it is very helpful, Mataji, for me. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you for a very beautiful question, Mataji. Very beautiful question. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, Hare Krishna, Mataji. I had a quick question related to these. Uh, so basically, while we, when we are chanting also, is that the mood that we should have? When we are chanting, um, uh, basically, the, uh, first identify ourselves with the fact that who is our spiritual master and then begging spiritual master that he can give us mercy so that we can chant Absolutely. in a, um, a mood. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Because Absolutely. we can... Okay, I was not doing that, so, okay, thank you, Mother. Yes, Could you just elaborate yeah, a little yeah. bit on that? How, uh, how can we improve our chanting, linking it to the spiritual master? If you can just say a few yeah. words. Generally, generally, what happens is that, um, you know, we say, okay, you can just say the Panchatattva Pranam Mantra, Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya, and then just say Hare Krishna Mantra. But then, you know, I personally... Um, always chant Guru Pranam Mantra first, then Prabhupada Pranam Mantra, and then Panchatattva Mantra, then start chanting. It just takes, you know, less than, you know, maybe, a, you know, less than 30 seconds sometimes, you know, to just chant these three mantras. And then continue on with the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. I do that at every round. So it just, what happens is that just out of my personal experience, it just keeps us very, very grounded, you know, and also, it helps our uh, the deflation of our ego, so to speak, that uh, we always are in the consciousness that, yes, we are the servant of the servant of the servant of our spiritual master, you know, that we are in that mood that we are not approaching the holy name on our own or directly through Mahaprabhu, or even just through Srila Prabhupada, that we need our spiritual master to even approach Srila Prabhupada. Of course, if you've not chosen any guru yet, then chant with Srila Prabhupada first, you know, and then Prabhupada will guide us to whoever our guru will be. But we need guru in the life, you know. So therefore, chanting our japa also, um, it really helps, uh, it particularly helps me. I mean, just from my personal experience, I can say that it just helps me develop a very close connection, you know, um, I'm able to reinforce my vows, you know, that I have given to my spiritual master, that it, it just reinforces it in my mind that, yes, I am, you know, following the instructions of my spiritual master. This is an offering to my spiritual master, that I'm trying to please him by doing this service of chanting the holy names. You know, because of course I'm not at that level at that, that I'm level chanting, that... uh, you know, unconditionally and unmotivatedly, no, or uninterruptedly. I have to force myself to chant. So the forcing of my chanting, it comes when I bring my spiritual master in the picture, you know. That when I'm doing it as an offering to him, then automatically I just do it, you know. I just, I just feel like doing it very naturally for him. If it is Thank just you. for Krishna, then, you know, I would maybe have some doubts. I would say, yeah, maybe Krishna is seeing, maybe Krishna is not. But I have promised my spiritual master, so I, mm-hmm. I want to fulfill that vow. So that chanting his Guru Pranam Mantra really helps me reinforce that particular fact, you know. Thank you, Mataji. Thank you. That helps me too. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.